It's the Opie and Anthony Show. Chris Cornell making his way into the studio. Also, still to come today, what the hell is that? I just got the list of some of the things we're going to be looking at today. Yeah. Oh, we got some good ones, man. Got a couple doctors, and uh, we got some listeners coming in with stuff happening on their bodies. And the doctors are going to finally tell them, what the hell is that? You know, we got an uh, uh, an uvula. What's that? Uh, a u- uvula. U- uvula. Uvula. U- u- uvula. That's split in half. Yeah. We got the guy that has uh, uh, two holes. All right. Let's Look. keep it at that for now. Another guy that just has some weird thing on his head. He doesn't know what it is. We got a guy that has a, a nostril that's, that kind of just stretches across right. his face. Nose guy. Uh, we got... Um, a guy that has a bump on his head that leaks pus. Oh, God, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. That's what? why we had you in today, what's Bob. A, what's a uvula? Uh, that, is that like a chick? Isn't, no. Isn't that that thing? That's in, the punching bag in the back of your you know, throat. You that thing goes, oh, oh, oh. You know, whenever in cartoons, uh, someone would jump in another thing's mouth and go, that's what it is. You know, Bobby, Bobby never gets cut a break. Yeah. He's on camera. Eating his uh, blueberries and the comments that are coming through on Pal Talk that you're you're not even chewing, you're swallowing them like a duck. Uh, <laughs> you eat like a monkey. Uh, Bobby looks like the Edge if he was stung by ten thousand bees because <laughs> he's got his black his black cap on. Wow, I'm glad I can, I'm glad I can make you guys think. Hey, for it's a Chris second. Cornell. Uh, how you doing, man? One of the. How do you know it's Chris Cornell? Because I've seen you before. <laughs> oh, it's Chris Cornell, yeah. one of the greatest singers in rock history, That's right there. Thank I've, you. I've always said it. I've I, always said that uh, we've been huge, one of the best. We've been huge fans, and that's why we're kind of disappointed. We got to at least acknowledge the fact that uh, we got a lot of equipment set up because we <laughs> thought you were playing today, and there was a mis- we there just, was a miscommunication somewhere. We were just talking about that. How I don't know how the miscommunication happened, but I'll sing a little bit for you. If I could put time in a bottle, <laughs> then there's one thing I'd like to do. Hmm. I'd put some time in the bottle, and then I'd have time in a bottle. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, thank you. Wow. I came through. I totally Jim Croce. Came through. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how people like... Like somebody says, oh, yeah, 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 uh, Chris will come in and sing. And even I was like, it's kind of early yeah, for and someone I, yeah. to sing. I know how it is to wake up and try to belt something out. <laughs> yeah. You know, especially with your, your range and uh, vocal style, it's not really conducive to morning singing. Not really. I mean, I've done it, but you have to wake up even you know a couple hours earlier and yeah. sort of kind of take a shower and sing. A or stay up all night sick. or something. Well, that's sort of what I'm doing now. I was uh, I played a show last night and the night before at the Beacon. So Two sold-out shows yeah. at the Beacon. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I've slept. I've had about an hour of sleep right, right now. That's why I don't. I don't really know where I am. <laughs> <laughs> You're just kind of singing Jim Croce. For you. <laughs> that's why that's happening. I like your version better. <laughs> time in a bottle. Yeah. Just to get it out of the way, the last time we saw you, you were in uh, Audio Slave. Mm-hmm. You were the lead man for Audio Slave. What happened? Just, um, just time to move on. Yeah, I, you know, I had a solo career happening, and that's sort of why Audio Slave was able to happen for me, and it was uh, an opportunity that came up, and really from. Since Temple of the Dog, I've thought, and I want to keep my mind open to cool collaborative ideas. And it was that. Um, but we did three albums pretty quickly, and I'm very proud of them, love the albums, and then just felt like it was time for me to move on right. and, and um, go back to my own world of kind of doing whatever I want. I, I always thought you were your own person. Like, it's hard for you to just stay in a band. Maybe I got issues. <laughs> like, <laughs> I was thinking that about that, like, I get you know, a little stir-crazy. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, but you've been successful no matter what you, you've done, you know, with Soundgarden and then the Temple yeah. of the Dog, which, by the way, I'm a huge fan of that album. Huge. I can't get enough of it. I was I was just uh, 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 jamming Say Hello to Heaven the other day, just, mm-hmm. just singing along to that freaking song, and, and my vocals are nothing like Oh, yours. don't <laughs> sing along to Nothing that, like uh, yours. Oh, that's... And then, <laughs> what's your favorite? song on it. Say hello to heaven. Say hello to heaven. Okay, yeah, two, yeah. three, go. <laughs> no way. <laughs> and, oh, you're on. No way, man. <laughs> yeah, I, I love when people... You don't understand how that is uh, for a guy that has a range like you when people go... Hey, could you sing that song? Like if you're a singer and yeah. people go, "Hey, sing, sing that uh, Soundgarden song," or sing that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're like, no, you don't understand. It doesn't just come out like that. 
Yeah. That's where the talent part is. <laughs> Sometimes when I put the mic, aim the mic toward the audience at the wrong time in certain songs and stuff doesn't come back. It's yeah. Like, it's like, it, it's not, hey, Chris, man, we, we just can't yeah. do that. It's not, it. I realize, what are you oh, doing? Yeah. If it's like everybody say, yay, they're going to come up with a yay, but it, it, certain parts of songs, it might not come back the right way. Yeah. But, the real high part of Sailor yeah, Heaven. Yeah. yeah. He has it's one like of that. those voices that you actually think you can sing, like Journey. You actually think you can <laughs> Sing that good. Well, you actually... got to go into falsetto, so yeah. you got no power at all. But you, you, but you, you just, think he's oh, great. You're singing like a little girl. Say hello to heaven. <laughs> yeah. heaven. That's, that's pretty good. <laughs> and knows how to sing. <laughs> no, you, you can carry a tune. He down, he down sing, plays it, but, but Anthony uh, knows how to sing. He really does. Yeah. I, uh, I used to have a few bands back uh, back in the old days, you know. you got to hear his Neil Diamond, Chris. Oh, oh fuck. I'll sing Neil all day and all night. All day. Don't get me, don't get me started on the Neil. I heard about, uh, like, I read something where you, when you first started singing, you actually tried to figure out where your range was and really couldn't even find it. <laughs> it's that, it, you just kept trying to go higher and higher. Well, and uh, it would. You wouldn't crack? I would sort of want to scream, you know, and there are parts of the songs that were written where it's just screaming. That's the part. You know, mm -hmm. there's a melody and then there's the screaming part. And to scream, I would just sort of sing above my range and then your voice breaks up and it gets all sh shrill and it's white noisy. And we were working on a particular song called Heretic that the bass player wrote the, the lyrics for and he all he could do was scream really but then it was decided that I was going to now sing it so I would scream that part and one day I kind of went really high to, to get my voice to break up and there were like a whole bunch of notes up there <laughs> and that's kind of where it started and then I would come back a couple days later and there wouldn't be you know, and so it kind of, you know, some days I could sing the notes, some days I couldn't. And then it, it was sort of on the job training. We, we were a band for three years before we put out a record. We played a lot. Um, and then we toured, um, you know, for years before really we started selling records. That's amazing to me. We did. Like, I, I, I was remembering been... now because I, I, like, uh, if I do three shows in a row, um, I'm kind of, you know, that's enough. A little shot. I need a day off. And uh, our song I remember we did 18 shows in a row. <laughs> wow. Christ. And I'm thinking, like, how did I do that? 18 <laughs> in a row. If you can do 18 in a row, you can do 365 in a row, I figure. Uh, yeah, yeah difference? right. I mean, after Damn. about 10. Um, you wake so, up in the morning going like, uh-oh, can't do it tonight. No way. I didn't, I didn't remember worrying about it too much. Don't I, talk I feel to like me. what I do now is much better than what I did then because I you know, pay a lot more attention to it. You know, and I want to like uh, – part of it is like people saying, well, this guy's a great singer and, and uh, he was number whatever on the list of great singers. And, and over the years I've thought, well, i got to kind of live up to that. So, yeah. you know, I, I kind of try to to make sure I'm in good vocal form. And I don't know, I, I think back then it was a little more crazy. And, and Soundgarden was so loud yeah. that in some ways it kind of, if I sang the best I'd ever sang in my life, I'm not sure you would have heard it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what about, um, Jesus, what the hell was I just going to ask you? Uh, well, speaking of Soundgarden, you guys ever... I hate when that happens. Would you get back together? I had a great question. <laughs> we do, too. Yeah. Nah, go screw yourself, Bobby. <laughs> Where are you at with Soundgarden? Would you guys ever like do a little something-something? I don't think so. You're um, done with them, too. Well, it's been 10 years now, yeah. and I don't, not once have I ever received a call or heard of anybody wanting to get that going again. So The fans, man! That's who wants it to get back together. Yeah, you guys yeah. had some great stuff. Yeah, how long can time go by before it gets silly that you get yeah. together again? I don't know. I think it's so Are you past cool to not do it. To just <laughs> not do it? Yeah. It's a way of, especially nowadays with everyone getting back together, it's a way of being cutting edge. We can, Soundgarden can be cutting edge by doing absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, sort of a genius in that. We don't have to get up. Do you do? They're uh, really ahead of the game, man. They're ahead of everybody. You do uh, Soundgarden tunes, a couple of them, uh, when you play out? Yeah, I do a lot of different songs. Yeah. Um, the, the band I have out now is like really amazing, and, and I'm having a, an incredible time with them. We're doing songs from, I think the oldest one we've done is off of Louder Than Love. Um, and they play great. And then kind of everything from then on. There's a lot of solo songs I did over the years from movies. And then you do seasons. Kinda, yeah, we do that. Oh God, I love that song. Anything from the single want, soundtrack. From, yeah, from the single soundtrack. Um, anything I want from Soundgarden. Um, we do. We know like about th three or four um, Temple of the Dog songs and um, 
we do a couple audio slave songs and then for my two solo records and um and then i do weird cover songs occasionally you do billy jean i do that yeah i was just I hearing about, about that. that i haven't heard it yet yeah. but I, I i hear it's almost unrecognizable you do yeah it's thing very different it's like a sort of gospel-y it's actually a heavy song lyrically about a guy who you know gets involved with this woman who says this is your kid and it's not his kid and it's like all we remember really is it's a dance track and he's walking <laughs> yeah. backwards but it looks like he's walking forward <laughs> and um <laughs> I, I, did, I ended up doing that because I, I had this period in the set where I do acoustic songs and I just started getting goofy and like trying to pick silly songs or songs you wouldn't expect and, um, to play and just kind of freak the audience out. And I thought, who would be really like the last person anyone would ever expect me to cover? And I thought, Michael Jackson. But then when I kind of owned raveled that song and was reading the lyrics and I changed the time signature and made it sort of gospely it became really kind of heavy yeah and and I really liked it and that's how it ended up on the record I just thought it, you know this is it's a good thing to like remind an audience occasionally that you know songs and music are really pliable and malleable and, and we don't really have genres don't really exist like we want them to sometimes mm. you know you can like when Johnny Cash did Rusty Cage I kind of learned a big lesson there um, did you like it? I loved it. Yeah. I remember Rick Rubin asking me to do an, do an arrangement of Rusty Cage so that Johnny Cash could record it, and I thought he was out of his mind. <laughs> and I actually tried like an idiot, and, and then called him and said, that, no, I can't do it. And then it, he didn't do it for that record. He did it for another record, and, and then I heard it, and, of course, it it went do 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 like every other song, and then and then the the lyrics to Rusty Cage, like oh, that's that's how you do that. How you do it for John? Now I get it. But people actually listen to the lyrics when he sang them, and then I would get phone messages from people saying, the, oh, and the lyrics to that song are great. And I would think, well, why didn't you say that to me five years ago? <laughs> because Johnny Cash wasn't singing them, is why. And we listened to him. Um, you, so it was you, like that a little bit. You uh, did you write most of the songs that are you know known as your songs, popular um, uh, Soundgarden and. I wrote a lot of the singles. I wrote, I think, most of the songs we ever made videos for, that kind of thing. Yeah. Like the Outshine, Black Hole Sun, Fell on Black Days, Spoon, uh, Spoon Man. Man. Do you, like, do you, when you play those now, mm -hmm. do you think, like, holy crap, I can't believe I'm still playing this song? <laughs> not really. No? And I'm, I'm not sure why. I think because there's been breaks in the, in that period. Yeah, like, true. You're not just out there pumping it out yeah. like that the whole time. You've... And there's so many songs. Like it, mm -hmm. If you think about it, Soundgarden, especially the last couple records, we could never agree on what songs should go on a record. Um, so we'd go in the studio and record like 16, 15, 16 songs, and we couldn't cut it down to 10 or 12, so we would just put them all on it because that was easier than trying to argue. Um, <laughs> wow. So the, the, the last couple records were really like double albums, and it's just because of the compact disc we could fit like 78 minutes of music on it mm. and then when we put them on vinyl they are actually double albums um so there's a lot of songs and there are songs we i've been doing uh songs here and there that soundgarden wrote that we never actually even performed i don't think yeah it's probably different for like the wang chung guys <laughs> i think they're probably like i can't believe we're still doing oh, yeah. everybody wang, wang chung, chung tonight, tonight or huh? aha take on me guy right, right, right. kaja goo goo <laughs> <laughs> yeah are you they ever... back together? My goodness. Yeah, that together. would be a great triple bill. Oh, hell yeah. Huh? I remember the, you know, the, the movie Live and Die in L.A.? Yeah. And, yeah. They, and Wang Chung wrote the theme song to that yep. right. called Live and Die, Live in, and LA. die in L.A. <laughs> and the video was great because they don't, they're not actually sitting with guitars and kind of writing the song. It's all, they're all just sort of writing the music. And there's a scene where they're kind of looking at each other. And one guy writes a note on the sheet music and then they high five. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was just the greatest video 80s rock video moment ever just... that's a great no give me some skin <laughs> it's so easy back then to make videos no kidding you just needed a little fire yeah <laughs> and some, some high-fiving over notes yeah. Yeah. but as an artist uh do you listen to any of your old songs and wish oh god i wish i could redo this like there's a part in it where you you just most of it like um 
the music and and like the guitar sounds and what's going on sonically and the parts I I think are like better than I remember them. Sometimes I listen to the vocal performances and and that bothers me. Really? Not all of it, but sometimes yeah. Sometimes it sounds like it's somebody else or like I'm hmm. I'm you know I've got some attitude going in there that has something to do with more than just singing the song. You know, it's like it's not who I am now. And, and do you have an so example like, of that? Oh, I would rather do that. Wow. A song we all know, or um, there there are parts of like the Louder Than Love record that bother me. I don't really know if I could say what song. Yeah. Um, but like something must have been going on in, like I'm, in your head like, at the time. Like maybe I'm I'm just sort of forcing it a little bit. Like, really? You know what I can do? I can do it. I can sing it, but it's like there's something going on there where it's like like it's acting. I guess is the best way to put it. Yeah. And I didn't notice it then, but all these years later, you know, with the experience that I have making records and just trying to be myself um, with a microphone in front of me, uh, I can hear that little bit of like, okay, there, here's a kid in there um, screaming his ass off, but there's like <laughs> something in there that's not, you know, there's something in there that wasn't entirely me that's coming out. Maybe it's tension. I don't know. There is something about uh, youth that mm -hmm. will just make you do that, like yeah. balls out. And There was a song we wrote, um, I wrote actually called Cold Bitch that ended up being like a, a B-side for something. Um, and I had it. I, I got it on my iPod. I took it off of Tom Morello's iPod, and I hadn't heard it in years. And it starts out. And it's very Zeppelin-y, and it's this big sort of cascading riff, and it sounds so great. And I'm just loving it, thinking, God, I wrote this song. And then the vocal comes in, and it's so high. It's like it's so embarrassing. <laughs> and I think that was probably like my masterpiece that never really came to fruition because I was such an idiot. But I thought, okay, I've got this great range. I'm just going to sing way up there. And and it's just silly to me. <laughs> no, that was probably like 1991 uh, or something. You would even think like that, like, oh, God, yeah, listen just, to me. <laughs> oh, what an ass. <laughs> it comes in. And it's just so bad. Do you have any, t like, stuff from way before you even started seriously playing, maybe with just, like, friends in, in a garage or a basement that you listen to or, or would go like, oh, I couldn't even listen to that? Embarrassing. I don't know if I have that. I, uh, maybe like when you were really younger, like almost out 80s ish a, yeah. stuff, maybe. I started out as a drummer, and there were probably some tapes of me playing drums on stuff. Not much, though. Yeah. But it wasn't very good, that's for sure. No, no, I do remember that. No singing, though, with some real hokey, dopey lyrics or no, something like that? No. no. No, I was always a genius. Soundgarden writer. was my first band. I mean, there were some Soundgarden's songs. Wow. first band. That, that was my first oh, band where suck. I sang. you suck. It's true. That's great, Otherwise, man. it was drumming in, like, bad 80s bar bands. <laughs> that's yeah. why Soundgarden happened, because, like, uh, I ran into two other guys who kind of were having the same experience. Like, wow, if we're going to be in a band that we like, we have to kind of do it ourselves. And I, that was when I actually picked up guitar and bass and started writing lyrics because I thought well, if we're gonna if we're gonna have good songs we kind of have to do it we can't wait for somebody else to show up. Who who uh, who was uh, in the band when you were the drummer and like wh where where are they? Do you? I have no idea. No idea. I was in probably ten bands from seventeen. Do you know what that's 21. like to like be like, dude? Chris Cornell was our drummer. Yeah, they're still talking about just, you. Oh, they're, they're still, still talking they're about still, you at a bar somewhere. They're sitting there Saturday night at the bar <laughs> right. going, dude, yeah. let me tell you, our drummer was Chris Cornell. And they're like, yeah, yeah. shut up. Yeah, yeah shut up. I was the cards. singer, man. I was the singer. Shut up. It's your turn to get around. Yeah. <laughs> you're you're think, the top eight on MySpace. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> shut up. We're up. Yeah. It's, we're up. It starts time. Yeah. <laughs> I used to have a great way of quitting those bands, too, which is I, I would say, and very sincerely, I would say, you know what? I just don't think I'm... I I really am good enough to be in your band. <laughs> oh, that's sweet. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> a great. Like you guys it. are just a little bit behind because I was really young too. Everyone was always older than me. I'm um, holding you guys back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and and they would always look at me, you know, thinking, I don't know, if this guy's telling us. To do it. But, um, that was the only way I could do it. But really, as a drummer, I thought I had this romantic idea that if I if I practiced and worked at it hard enough, some amazing band would just kind of roll through Seattle and go, that guy's so great, we want him to be our drummer. Um, and that didn't happen, at least not in Seattle. I mean, it was just never going to happen. Yeah. Um, and Kim and Hero, the the co-founders of Soundgarden, I met um, 
one was the bass player and one was kind of the fill-in bass player for one of those bad bar bands that I was in. <laughs> and I met them that way. And neither of them liked the band and neither did I. But we ended up starting a band together because we decided, well, we're going to have to, you know, figure out a way to be in a good band and we're going to have to write songs. And if someone else can do it, why can't we do it? And then we, we spent like a couple years writing songs and we had those like initial young band kind of awkward songs that had good parts but were sort of overdone and some of them were kind of silly and there's some probably some embarrassing stuff in there were you, were you like uh, influenced by anything at the time because Soundgarden is known to be one of those bands during the grunge period that mm -hmm. was like you know wow this is a standout band uh how did because it was a complete change of music. It went from mm -hmm. that 80s hair stuff to the stuff you guys were doing. Yeah. Like, what what changed that for you? How did how were you able to take that 80s stuff and completely get it out of your head um, and get into this new music? We it's were, just so odd to me that... We were kind of in, um, or wanting to be, initially, in what was a very healthy U.S. indie record scene at the time, which mm -hmm. had ba bands like uh, Black Flag and Bad Brains and Husker Du and Sonic Youth. And the one wrinkle that we put on it was, and maybe it's because Seattle was always sort of a guitar-based kind of place, we wanted to include 70s rock influences that we liked. You know, riff rock, old school, not necessarily like the 20-minute guitar solos and things <laughs> like that, but um, heavy rock that we liked from the 70s, which was not really allowed. Since punk rock, that was sort of not cool. And I think that was a big part of what happened with Seattle, was just a mixture of influences. Like, we took aspects of older arena rock that, w that were good and mixed it with, with more modern kind of post-punk music. And... Mm. It, it just took a, a few years for people to realize, oh, wait, that's okay. There there are elements of 70s rock that are great. Um, and what happened with hair metal was they, they sort of, like, they would see Led Zeppelin and they would take, like, the kimono and the dove and the light show. And they would forget about, like, the fact that it was the best rhythm section in any rock band ever. Um, they would concentrate on, okay, Robert Plant had a really high range. So they would just find a singer that could sing a high range and forget about how great the riffs were or the melodies or the music that was all sort of left behind um and i think for us we just didn't want to we didn't want to completely abandon music that we liked so we, we sort of put it in there and we were not always loved we were sort of hated for a while really that. yeah i remember playing like vancouver canada and, and like ashtrays whizzing past my head jesus christ um because that I always thought of those as good shows, though we felt like <laughs> they, worse. if that's happening, um, we maybe we we're onto something. We know something they don't know, you know. Yeah, I think that was it. Because like uh, not being in Seattle at the time and that kind of being the epicenter of what was going on, you guys were ahead of the curve mm -hmm. uh, as to what you know was going to kind of take off in the country. You you kind of saw it building there, and. Uh, the rest of the country and Vancouver apparently had to, <laughs> yeah. had to kind of catch on. Yeah. I always thought of it as like, you know, you got this white snake video with the guy who's, <laughs> whose model wife or whatever is doing the splits on a variety of Jaguars, right? And right. it's... It's kind of what hip hop does sometimes, which is separating the the artist from the audience and like basically throwing it in your face, like you ain't gonna be me and you're never gonna have her. And then you then you see like smells like Teen Spirit, which is probably a catchier song in the pop world, mm -hmm. um, and and a, with with a youthful aggression, but with three guys. One guy's like six nine. One guy's like five <laughs> five. Um, and they just look like the same people that you go to high school with. I think that was the the key factor in, in like this tremendous cultural shift was mm. like, okay, we don't, you know, seeing a video of Motley Crue coming down in the helicopter is kind of cool, but this is cooler, and this is what we've been missing. Unattainable. Yeah, is yeah. What that exactly. was, you know, that was rock and roll. And yeah. That uh, it it just seemed to happen so quickly too. It, Which like is proof really, that, yeah. and the fans do that. Record companies don't do that. There is no kind of marketing that can mm -hmm. make that happen like that that quickly. That was literally like a whole bunch of 
young rock fans that said, oh, this is what we've been wanting. Being in that atmosphere in Seattle, did you, were you as taken by Smells Like Teen Spirit as the rest of the country was? Where, how that was kind of like, wow, what the hell's going on here? I remember Ben, ben Shepard coming into a Soundgarden rehearsal before they had even made that record and um, said, yeah, I saw Nirvana last night. And, and he got the name wrong. He said, um, they had this song uh, smells like teenage spirit. It's amazing. I think it's, I think it's going to be a huge hit, which is weird hearing him even say that. Yeah, and that was probably uh, like eight months before it was recorded. Um, but it was like that. You know, you, they would play in front of a hundred people, and um, that was around the time when th that talk started happening. Like, um, you know, it's not just an indie scene. This is something mm -hmm. that that can be like new rock and roll for the masses kind of thing. And then you got the pissed off fans that were there from the beginning going, of sell out, yeah. man. Always, what are you yeah. doing, man? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah. People like us. What yeah. can we do? Yeah, you liked us, but the other people aren't allowed to. Yeah. Right. Is that how it works? Because everybody kind of wants to think they're a little yeah. cooler than everybody else. So if other people start liking you, yeah. it's like, wait, I thought I was too cool. Yeah, exactly. You know, no one's that cool to like these guys. Exactly. <laughs> it, it, it happens. Yeah. Well, we got to get, uh, get Chris out of here so he can sleep. <laughs> yeah, go to sleep, Chris. Uh, it's uh, Chris Cornell. The solo CDs carry on. It, yeah. It's, uh, I tracked through it last night. It's awesome. Thank you. Very, very, uh, and very, very cool. Even though you didn't play, we, we love having you in. You're a great, uh, a great conversation, man. Thank you. It's really cool to Next talk to you. Next time I'll play, I'll, go, I'll get some other Jim Croce. Kind of <laughs> yeah, do that. What, what is the Don't Mess Around with Slim? Or, uh, yeah, don't. Uh, uh, what, what are some of the big hits uh, before he died? Uh, bad, bad Leroy Brown. There you go. That was Superman. Yeah. You know, he's the baddest man in the whole damn town. He's actually Superman. good live. You see him doing that stuff live. He's great. Well, oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Really yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Also, uh, get for you getting your DeLorean. For everybody in New York, <laughs> Chris Cornell's doing Afternoon Drive on uh, this fine radio station. Yes. 92 yeah. 3 K Rock from 3 to 7 today. So, mm -hmm. Chris Cornell, always a pleasure. Thank you. It's uh, Carry On, his latest CD. Check it out. It's Opie and Anthony.